Hi, and welcome to a small, medium, at large podcast. I'm your host, Gail Heisen, bringing you intimate interviews beyond normal boundaries. I want to thank all of you for subscribing, liking, sharing, and just giving us your comments and feedback when you've watched shows that we've had. We've had some very exciting guests and a lot more exciting ones to come. I want to thank uh, my children for, for, for doing the posting and the production of our show. And I want to thank my husband for help with all the feedback I get from him when I'm doing the show. And I want to thank you all for being here today. And I hope you enjoy being with Etta as much as I do. I want to tell you a little bit about Etta. Dr. Etta D. Jackson was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and she came to the U.S. as a student in 1965. Dr. Jackson worked in the field of education for 25 years as a teacher, guidance counselor, and district administrator in both New York and Wisconsin. Dr. Jackson has a degree in biology and psychoanalytical counseling and development, and a degree in administration leadership and supervision as well. She received her PhD in leadership and change, titled The Role of Geospatial Information and Effective Partnership in the Implementation of the International Agenda for Sustainable Development. Her passion for wanting to make a difference led her to the founding of the Institute for Conscious Global Change, ICGC, an international nonprofit NGO organization in special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. She now serves as the CEO of this institute. This New York-based organization was founded in 2007 with the objective of providing a comprehensive response to fundamentally changing the way humanity lives in and creates its environment. The focus of their work is to provide visual but tangible development solutions to support the unfinished mandate of the United Nations Millennial Millennium Development Goals and now Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. With the aid of Geographic Information Systems Earth Observation and Geodesign Technologies, ICGC engages governments and citizens to develop integrated, holistic, and comprehensive models for implementation in each country. ICGC believes this approach is essential for the eradication of extreme poverty to create the future we want and ensure no one is left behind. ICGC seeks to put equality on the map. Her dissertation was done in the informal setting of Manyata in the city of Kisumu in Western Kenya, which resulted in the geo-design of the community. She has written four books, which we will talk about to today. Understanding Your Choice, Unveiling the Secrets of the Feminine Principle, The Role of Consciousness in Governance, and the idea that is the United States of America, it's a cult foundation. You can find her books on Amazon and her website. For those of you just listening and not on YouTube, the website is www, lowercase e, t, t, a, d, j, a, c, k, s, o, n, dot com. She is a mother and grandmother. Let's welcome Etta here today. Hi, Etta. Welcome. There, yeah, Gail. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And it's a pleasure to finally meet you. <laughs> pleasure to meet you. And I... I want to give a shout out to Rhonda Grant for uh, putting us together. Yes. Um, uh, I, I just love that other podcasters that we share, different guests we have, so mm -hmm. that we heard by uh, the different listeners that each person attracts. So yes. Let's thank Rhonda. She's been a very, very wonderful um, new podcast friend. Yes. Yes. It was a pleasure meeting her. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so I want to begin with the thing that I do with every guest. Mm -hmm. is I always like to start at the beginning. Yes. Uh, off, I have to just mention that 
you are only the second woman I have ever met with the same name as my mother, Etta. So it's a joy here to be using that name again since she's no longer with us. So, yeah, that was so interesting to hear. Yes. That, that was your mom's name. It's, it's, it's a small world, isn't it? We're all, yes, because it's a very uncommon name. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, as a child, did you grow up in a religious or spiritual home? And we know you grew up in Kingston, Jamaica. Did anything happen during these young years that put you on the path you are on today? Like some no, people. Well, I, yeah, well, well, yes and no. Um, I was born in Kingston, but then my parents moved back to my father's village, which was um, in St. Catherine, Loida's Vale. So I grew up in a village. Oh. I was born in Kingston, but I grew up in a village, yes. They so, say village. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a village, right? And yes, I, um, the religion of my mother and father was um, Catholicism. But there was not a Catholic church in the village. So we had to go a little distance from time to time to mass. And then eventually, as that didn't work anymore, we ended up going to different churches in the village. So, so I have put my feet in many different religions over the years. Yeah, so, yeah. So, but to your question, I don't see any of those religious interactions as really informing my life in a, in a very significant way. Because from a child, I, I keep saying I came here. <laughs> <laughs> I came here um, sort of having this knowledge that was outside the bounds of traditional religion. So traditional religion would see me as rather strange, uh, odd, because it, it was different. Um, I, I say to myself that I came here remembering a lot. So it's like I felt from a child that I was, I lived in two worlds. Mm -hmm. I knew the world that I was living in, but I knew something else. And it was hard to communicate that, you know, it's hard for you as a child to, you know, talk about these things that you know that other people find odd and different because they're not consistent with religion or you know the culture so I had to be very careful about <laughs> what I said as a child because I had these memories so yeah but I I attended re you know religious organizations but I wouldn't say that they informed me in what my how my life has unfolded yeah so during that time you felt I, I was raised an atheist, so I know almost. Oh, okay. I know zero about uh, religion, but my 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 grandparents and the rest of my family were all raised uh, in the Jewish faith. Okay. And my father was not in the belief of God or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have very strong beliefs myself and lots of spiritual experience. Yes. Uh, I consider them all. You know, you can I can use the word God or whatever, but it's not. Mm -hmm. I, I choose the word the universe I feel like the universe takes yes I, I use that term too yeah because it's so, more appropriate <laughs> yes yeah, so I so in some of the things I really didn't have a reference to I don't have any references to biblical I know nothing about anything in the bible uh, okay the easiest thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah and so knowing that you were getting as I understood, when you were 12 or something, were you starting to receive what we sometimes now call as downloads or information or channels? No, or... Yeah, it was earlier than that. I'd say six, seven years old. And it was um, more like, I talk about this golden white light that yeah. sort of in, overshadow me. It's like I'm in this tube of light, yeah. you know, that overshadows me. And there is no... Um, audible voice. It's just 
information, like you said, download of, it's like an imprint mm -hmm. on your cells that is knowing. I remember telling my mother that what I know is in my cells, not in my head, you know. <laughs> As a young child, that's, that's yes. not a usual comment a child would say. Yeah, yeah, but that's like what I know. An old, soul, an old wise soul. <laughs> but that's what I know to be true. So and that's the only language I had to, I could use to explain to her the absoluteness of what I know, mm -hmm. that it was in myself. And yeah. So it wasn't something I thought of in my head, <laughs> you know. Right, and the cells hold the DNA and the memories. Yes. Of, if you believe in other lifetimes or mm -hmm. past experiences or even of things that happen to others. Yes. You know, so all of yeah. the uh, things that happen in the world happen mm -hmm. in the body it has a memory mm -hmm. of these. I think mm -hmm. that's why when they do a lot of this therapy to help people when they're having issues and they do body work instead of talking therapy, they have yes. a lot of success because they're they're pressing in into the body and asking the body to respond. Yes, and many times releasing, you know, trapped information in the body or energy in the body that you know that we carry from lifetime to lifetime. Because I do believe in reincarnation. So yeah, so that was like the context of my life. And so um, from that young, six, seven years old, I've had this experience with this light and um, just had a knowing about many things. I knew from a child that I came here and I keep using that term. I was born like everybody else, but I came here. So it was always a, a sense of an intentfulness to being here. Mm. I wasn't just born. I chose to come here. And, and as I was telling my mother when I was young that I came here to help with the liberation of humanity. Well, at six or seven years old, I had no idea what that meant. But that's what I knew in myself that I came here to help with the liberation of humanity. And it was only after as I got older and had a cognitive understanding of what that could be that, you know, I began to, it began to unfold, you know, what that, what I was saying, what it meant. Yeah. Was your mother accepting of the different things you, you were experiencing and just, was she supportive and just saying, yes, that's, you know, this is wonderful that you're feeling this way? Or was she like, no, no, don't have these thoughts? <laughs> It, 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 it was all strange to her and she used to keep asking me where do you get these things from you know, you know because they were so foreign mm -hmm. you know but it kind of silenced me because you know you get to understand that this is not acceptable information right so you kind of close down mm -hmm. I used to stutter a lot you know when I was young and I think it's because I had to choose my words so carefully, mm -hmm. you know, because because initially I used to just say things because I just felt that everybody understood what I was saying. And then I realized that, no, um, no, this is not <laughs> normal. <laughs> <laughs> so I started being very careful about what I say and who I say to because I used to see things, you know, and the light, and I would get this info, have this information, and so you begin to realize that, you know, maybe you're in a slightly different world than, you know, <laughs> than a regular folk. So, so yeah, so that was my experience growing up as a child. Did you start yeah. to like journal or express yourself privately or anything like this to keep? I remember writing an article to the Gleaner, which is the national newspaper in Jamaica when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember my, you know, and of course I was speaking about spirituality <laughs> 12 years old in this article to the paper. And my aunt saw it, you know, and kind of accosted me on these ideas, you know, but I had such a clear understanding, Gail, when I was young, that a lot of what the church was saying was not really what the truth of it was. Because mm -hmm. I had a sense that I knew what Jesus said. 
and he didn't say all these things and what you know and so I was having these arguments with people about the Jesus they know and the Jesus I know ah. and yeah and so um, so I wrote this article in the paper, you know, talking about some of those kinds of spiritual, you know, aspects to things, and they didn't go over too well. But <laughs> yes. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was very yeah. brave of you to do at twelve when there yeah. was one else supporting you. So when did you come to? uh the point of realizing like finding some camaraderie or was it when you went to college or when you started to decide to start writing I know you you started writing your books I believe in 1975 was that correct no um so one of the reasons I you know I, as you know I left Jamaica in, in 1965 to come to Howard University where I where I um studied and um, I wanted to leave Jamaica because Jamaica was such a religious country and I needed to be in a place. And America was always known as a place where you was, there was religious freedom, you could say what you want and you know you were free to express your thoughts no matter how controversial they were. And so I always wanted to come to America. And I said, if I came to America, I could speak what I wanted to say and I could be myself and, you know, have the freedom. So that was one of the motivations for wanting to come to the United States because I felt that I could express myself and, um, and, and maybe find more camaraderie you know, mm -hmm. with people who thought like me and could speak freely and discuss these ideas that were different, you know, and unconventional. And so, um, so that helped that, that, you know, I, on the university campuses, of course, you know, there's free thought, you can debate and you have philosophy, you know, you can philosoph, um, you know, have philosophical conversations. So it was a different environment. And that was very, um heartening for me because I, I I I felt freer yes you know for the first time so um but back to that um 1975 it was 1975 I had graduated from college at um, Southern Illinois University and moved to New York and I was standing at a street light um you know, New Yorkers don't really wait for the light to change. <laughs> I'm New Yorker, I know. I know, I know. <laughs> but I was standing at the street light and the light, this light that was so familiar to me from childhood, you know, overshadowed me and um and said to me, and again, not in an audible voice, but the imprint of the information was write this title down. It's the title of a book that you will write. So I went in my pocketbook, got out my little notepad and my pencil and wrote down the title. And I remember writing it down and then looking at it and said, what? <laughs> Me? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, because for one, the title, Understanding Your Choice, which was the title that was given to me, the title seemed so abstract. And I was 29 years old. And I had never written, you know, that, you know, at that level um, to write a book. So it's like I looked up at the light and I said, are you, are you sure you don't have the wrong person? <laughs> <laughs> Me, you know, write a book. I don't know how to write any book. So I was arguing, you know, with the lights. And and really just really clearly, I mean, I definitely thought that this was a mistake. You know, now, you know, I la you, you, you have to laugh at that because the light doesn't make mistakes, right? But, you know, I was just convinced that this was a mistake because this couldn't be me. And so every five to 10 years, I would, you know, remember the title and I would say the same thing to the light, you know, you have the wrong person. This is not me. I'm not, you know, and I just was going on about my life. And I really thought that over the years, it had just dissipated. 
you know, this idea of me writing this book about understanding your choice, that would just go away. But we know better, right? Yes. And <laughs> I come back, I'd left New York by then and I got came back to New York in 2000. Kind of had this intuitive feeling that I needed to come back to New York. Um, in a, um, briefly, came back to New York, was in this apartment in Harlem, my friend's apartment. And the light said to me, it's now time to write the book, <laughs> you know, 25 years later. <laughs> and uh, you say that. And I, I just want our listeners to understand because that's how I experience things. I don't hear any sound out here talking to me. Yes. Inside, I hear a voice. Yes. Not yes. me. It's not me, but this voice is telling me information. Yes. And it's and clear. It's yes. Clear. Yes. Very clear, very distinct. Well, that's exactly what it is. We, it, and so the light said, it is now time to write the book. And, uh, you know, for a second, I said, what, what book? And then I remember, oh, that book. Because <laughs> it's 25 years later. And But for the first time in 25 years, I had stopped arguing. Mm -hmm. Because I recognized that I was to write this book. And I really, I see now in retrospect that it took those 25 years for me to understand what understanding your choice meant. So the, um, so the light allowed me on my own personal journey to be informed about what understanding your choice meant so that I could actually write it. And I tell the story about the fact that in my at my friend's place where I stayed in Harlem, there was a desktop computer in the room I was staying. And in the living room on the bookshelf was a book titled How to Write a Book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was clear that, okay, you know, all the arguing is over and all the pushback has to end. And 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 I felt okay, you know, that this is what I had to do. And I really feel in retrospect too that this is something that I had agreed to do, really. And I really was being reminded of this. And um, as I tell the story about having written the book and you know, talk about, you know, the the you know the whole writing of it, I began writing the first chapter in New York. And by the time um, by the time I finished writing the first chapter, I was told by the light that I had to go to London to write the rest of the book. And so I called up my friend in London and asked her if I could come hang out at her house for a while to finish writing it because they wanted me to write the book in an academic format with references, bibliography, um, glossary, index, the whole nine yards. So, and that there were all these esoteric libraries in London that would, you know, um, be accessible to me. And so, but I also think in, a, in addition to those libraries in London, I think the setting of London is where the book needed to have been written for the most part. And mm -hmm. so that's, um, you know, how, how it did and then how it happened. And um, it was really such an intense process because I think the writing of the book in total was like nine months mm -hmm. from like beginning birth, to end. Like birth. Literally giving birth, absolutely. And that's how I felt too. I said, wow, this whole nine months of bringing this child into the world, this is, you know, that was my feeling too. So, and could you give us like just a small little summary of what the book is about? So, yes. Um, so the light said to me that I, it wanted me to write the book within the context of the prodigal son. And I don't know, you know, your audience know the um, story, but this is from an esoteric perspective, of course. The prodigal son lived in this palace with his father and an older brother. And then at some point, the, the prodigal son, the younger son said, 
I want to go into distant lands. I want to leave my father's house and I want to go out so that I can meet my brothers and sisters in that are different from me and from whom I can learn. So, so, and, and so what they wanted me to do is to help us. And the, the story of the prodigal son is symbolic of humanity that we are the prodigal son. And so it's a symbolic story of humanity's journey away from a place of comfort, security, sameness, to going out from that place of familiarity and sameness and protection to go explore the world, to meet and have ex meet other people that are different from you, who think differently from you, have experiences that are foreign to the ones that you were brought up with, because that's the only way that you're stretched. So the, the act of the prodigal son actually coming to that place within himself, where he recognized that he could not, if he is to grow and to know who he is, he, could, he cannot stay in this place because this environment does not allow him to expand and grow and to come into himself, into the fullness of himself. And so it's a symbolic story about humanity's journey, each person's journey, each country's journey. It's the same symbolic reference to um, going out. Mm -hmm. And then as we know about the prodigal son, um, after he had, he, had, he had asked his father to give him that portion of goods or money that was his, so that he could go on his journey. So his father gave him his portion of money and he went out and he did everything that was contrary to what he would have done at home or what would have been permitted to do at home. And so he went out and he did everything that you can imagine, spent all of his money and you know, was like at this place where he was destitute, had no money, and, you know, life was beginning to be rough. <laughs> and then the story says esoterically that he came to himself. And esoterically, it said that it's at that Scorpio point in his journey that he says, I must, he came to himself and decided that he must return to the father's house. And the sign of Scorpio in the body is the reproductive area. And if we know about the chakras, it's at that point, at the, at the Scorpio region, that the energy turns around and begins, that energy moves up, begin to move in the opposite direction and begin to open up the chakras. So you go out to go experience life, and then you begin to make meaning of those experiences and so this they wanted me to couch the book in in that um, context of the prodigal son because this relates to all of humanity and so um and so that was really the, the supposed to be the context they also said to me that um and i keep saying they and the light but you know i feel like i have a team that i work with in the unseen um that okay, um spirits or yes I feel that it might be like spirits can contact yes you. well i feel like i have a team i don't it, it i feel like i have a team you know before coming in that there was a team and a plan and that i would come into incarnation i feel like i have a team out of body i am in the body and it's like there's this relay of information and so we work together as a team. But um, the light wanted me to take this, this body of arcane knowledge and present it in the most accessible way possible so that the largest percentage of humanity would have access to it. So this was what was explained to me that um, we're now moving into this new age because the light said to me that toward the end of the Piscean age, that humanity would be in a lot of um, fear Very and nice. um, bewilderment and just trying to figure out what's going on. 
kind of where we are, right? Chaos, <laughs> kind of chaos. <laughs> yes, chaos and confusion and fear and intrepidation that that um, as this period came about, that humanity would be in this state and that the book, especially Understanding Your Choice, was meant to bring context to what humanity was experiencing. Because the idea, that's the title of the book, Understanding Your Choice, mm -hmm. that humanity made a decision to come to the planet, to be part of an experiment, to forget who he or she is and to immerse himself in the density of matter and forget so that he could have a legitimate, authentic experience in matter to feel and to experience that. And then like the prodigal son to come out of that and begin to make meaning out of those dark experiences. And why we should not curse, curse the darkness because the darkness provides information. And so if we allow all things to teach us, we will see that we have been expanded as individuals when we go down into the darkness of our lives. We have those dark experiences. And if you are willing to interpret them correctly, they will serve you. If not, they will spiral you down. So it's about how you interpret your life experiences that they will either serve you or, or not. I, I can tell you I'm an example of that. Because I've had people often say to me, I don't know how you survived that childhood. I don't know yes. how you be whole today. I don't mm -hmm. know how you could do this. And I say to them, even though we can look upon and judge the things that happened to me as being uh, uh, abusive or whatever the different things were, I said they were all my teachers. Mm -hmm. And all those experiences make me who I am today. The amount yep. of passion, the amount of things that I, I have feeling and understanding for, I wouldn't have had if I myself didn't experience it in my body or in my relationships. So Absolutely. I always say to them, I'm sharing this story with you because I'm hoping that you'll lighten up with your own self about your story <laughs> to realize that you shouldn't hate the parents or you shouldn't hate Absolutely. the person who did this to you. You should yes. just have nothing but love and forgiveness because mm -hmm. it's made you with the strength of being that you are today. Absolutely. But some people Absolutely. get destroyed by some of those experiences. Yes. And hold up. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and to what you're saying, uh, Gail, the, the story of the prodigal son also is exactly what you're saying. Because if we remember when the son came back home, he was afraid that his father would not ac accept him because he had done all these things that, you know, he was not raised to do. And so he thought that the father would be in judgment of him and wouldn't accept him back home. But the father, which was a wise man, um, knew that the experiences that he went out and had would inform who he would be or who he now is and how he would be later and if we remember the father was always looking down the street looking for him to come back because the father always knew that he would return just like we will we are now on the path of return on the on the path of um uh, aquarius we ended pisces and we've turned around and we're now on the path of return just like the prodigal son so he was on his way back home and the father was looking down the road, looking to see him come. And he ran and met him and put the cloak around him and escorted him home. And then he had a big party for him. But one of the things that um, also caused a little bit of a friction, if we remember the story, that he was actually elevated above the brother who stayed at home. Because the knowledge, like you were saying before, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding he had gained by having gone out into the far country and having all those experiences had expanded him, given him the wisdom to now be able to be the ruler. So he was elevated. He could now rule because he had knowledge. He had experiences like those people out in the far country. 
So he could understand their pain, their suffering, their experiences, which made him, which that was actually what qualified him to be in an exalted position of leadership. And so um, that that is the only way you you gain wisdom, right? And because that is the ultimate currency that you're seeking, you know, and you only get that through, through life experiences. And so that was important. That's they wanted me to couch the book in um, in in that story, so that humanity could see him or herself in the story of the prodigal son and what the whole journey here is really all about. It's almost like you read my next question, so I'm not going to have to answer ask you really, but it had to do with the age of a Pisces and the yes. age of Aquarius. <laughs> exactly. Explain what that means, so I'm not going to have to to ask that yeah now we're so, so we have gone through the 12 signs from yes. aries to pisces and now we are turning around just like the prodigal son and we're now on the path of return so all of that knowledge that we've gained we now need to like the prodigal son reflect on all the experiences of we've had We've gone down into darkness, into the depths of darkness. And now we're coming out and we're making our way back to the father's house. And oh, so a this good positive of feeling. <laughs> <laughs> fact, I like the image of, you know, just of, of everyone just walking toward the home again. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> because that's what it really is. You did. It really is. And so, so, and so while we're going through this, I call it the washover period the mm -hmm. end of Pisces and the beginning of, of Aquarius. And it can be very tumultuous because we, we are ending uh, the age of Pisces, which is 2,160 years. Wow. But simultaneously, we are ending the cosmic year of Pisces, which is approximately 26,000 years. So we're, that's why it's so tumultuous. Everything is coming up from the subconscious. To consciousness and we're having to make meaning out of all those experiences that we've had in order to be able to walk you know the journey home is the as a as a young teenager i was at a high school prom and it was the dawning of the age of aquarius i remember that song. and i was sitting there in a bar even though i was only 13 and, and they were singing right their yeah. feet were right in front of me singing that yeah. song. Yeah. And so I always you. wondered, was that when the age, I mean, is there a specific year that the age of Aquarius no. began? There's no dates like, you know, a date at 12 o'clock that. Oh, yeah. right. It's like I said, it's a washover period. It's like one is ending and the other one is coming in. So for the last maybe 300 years, Aquarius has been coming in. Oh. And if you begin to see the signs of that, if you begin, if you really be, to look at history, you'll begin to see the dawning, <laughs> like the song says. You're yeah. beginning to see these little embers of Aquarius beginning to emerge. And you begin to you see all, and if you understand the, uh, the attributions of the age of Aquarius, you'll see that, you know, it has, it's been coming in. It's been coming in little by little, but now we are now. I kind of feel that COVID sort of anchored us into the Aquarian age. Mm -hmm. Right. That was a yes. Another, that would be a whole other discussion for another show. Yes. Talk about what, that, what happened with that. Yes. So there's something you wrote about that I'm going to ask you about if you could talk about. And I'm, I'm now um, uh, referring to your other book. Um, Unveiling the Secrets of the, of the Feminine Principle. Yeah. And um, I have a couple of questions here about this, and I don't want to miss all my sexual questions. So <laughs> I'm not sure we get to that. So I'm going to ask you, I have a couple, two questions before I go into my sexual questions. But uh, what is the unfolding of the hidden knowledge known to be revealed by the woman clothed with the sun and wearing a crown of stars? She is, can you pronounce that for me? Is it Shekinah or Shekinah? Yeah, yeah, Shekinah. Shekinah, yeah. Yeah. the Holy Spirit and the revealer of the secrets of life. Is yeah. this 
is this some is this an image that's in the Bible or I didn't know where this came yeah. from. Yeah. Well, you know, well, part of it is, is knowledge. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> part of it is, you know, well, the information I bring for forward in in all three of the books and you know, to um clarify, the fourth book is actually chapter 8 of my third book. I thought that that chapter needed to be, you know, more accessible. So I made it into a little book, um, the idea that is the United States of America. So all of this knowledge um, has been around for a long time. It really never was hidden, but yeah. humanity had to get to the place mentally, intellectually, and emotionally to be mature enough to be able to accept, integrate, and decipher that kind of information. Because much of, a lot of it is controversial. Um, and I, I remember when I was, after I finished writing the book, they told me that um, I should kind of not put it out yet because humanity was not yet ready for, for this information. It was only four months ago I was told, to go to a podcast. So that's how come I, <laughs> I am speaking with you. So this ancient knowledge. So first of all, the um, the feminine, the divine feminine, she's actually the symbol of the Aquarian age. She's Isis. Mm -hmm. And in the tarot, she has, she's a, she's seen as the image of this woman who is naked. She's unveiled. Mm -hmm. And it's in con that image is in contrast to the high priestess who is completely veiled. She has a robe on. She has a scroll in her lap. And, and it's symbolic of the book that contains all the knowledge about humanity, creation, and all things. And she is veiled because it was not yet. To, and she is a symbol because that's the key that represents, um, is associated with the sign of Pisces. So, so you can see that during the Piscean age that this information was cloak, guarded, kept secret by the symbol of the high priestess. Now we're in the age of Aquarius and the symbol for that age is this naked woman, Isis. She has no clothes on, which means that that information that the high priestess was holding, uh, keeping secret, cloaked, veiled, is now ready for humanity to explore. And part of it is because the age of Pisces was the age that brought a lot of bodies into the, into the planet and also the growing and maturation of those bodies, physically, emotionally, and mentally. So by the end of the Piscean age, we had gotten to the place where she knew that she had done her job in bringing you in, educating you, helping you to eat properly, develop your body physically, and also in, in in, in masonry, they talk about the seven liberal arts. And those seven liberal arts are meant to inform your intellect so that you will be able to decipher that ancient knowledge that you were not able to during the Piscean age. And so the age of Aquarius is called the age of reason. And because now humanity has the intellectual and emotional capacity to be able to understand that level of complexity of knowledge of the ancient teachings. And they told me that that's why they asked, they asked me to take this vast body of arcane knowledge and present it to humanity in a way that is most accessible. And I really feel, Gail, that those 25 years that from when I was told to, that I was going to write the book until I actually wrote the first one was that I would have my own spiritual experience. So when I write the books, I'm not just referring to other authors 
and just saying, you know, um, what they said, but I know this to be true myself because I have walked that same journey. And what I am telling you is my, yes, I'm referring, I'm making references to other authors who can substantiate what I'm saying, but I know this. And so this is where we are. And um, we're at a wonderful place because yes, not all of humanity um, is ready, but it was never expected that everybody on the planet was all one, one you know, there was gonna be 100% um, under, you know, of humanity that would be able to grasp this level of knowledge. But I read somewhere that there's a 3367 split, that 67% of humanity will be able to move into the Aquarian age. And so we have to accept that 33% won't, because you also have to understand that there are many young souls that are here and, um, and they're progressing as they can and have the capacity to, but we shouldn't expect that we have a 100%, you know, um, movement into the Aquarian age. So this divine mother, the divine feminine, um, Shekinah, she is the creative, and this is part of what they wanted me to write about that book, to bring to the public, that she, she is actually the creative principle of the universe. She brought all things into manifestation. It is out of her womb that all things she created. She's the creator. The masculine is the idea, but she gave, put flesh to the idea and brought all things into manifestation. And that's the essence of that book, Unveiling the Secrets of the Feminine Principle. So, and is that, which brings me to a question I had here about, because I have, I have a lot of, I have a few different friends that, go on and on about the feminine and the masculine divine. And I don't know yes. what they're talking about. <laughs> well, they're both divine because they're both one, really. <laughs> so that's, but it just seems to be a lot of people are discussing this lately. And I don't know if it means that they're trying to honor the the, the feminine and all that they brought or, mm -hmm. uh, and are, are you saying that the, the women or the feminine is what birthed all of this and yeah. the masculine was, can you explain just what the masculine role? The idea. The divine? The idea. The ideas. The masculine is the idea and the feminine puts the flesh onto the idea. Huh. So okay. all things in the manifest world was created by her around the idea. But we also need to remember that the masculine and feminine are two not separate. They're separated out in our minds for the purpose of having a better understanding of how the two come together and how they are one. But there is no conflict, there is no competition, there is only one. There are two, and I think that's why also I keep, I refer to the golden white light. And that became evident to me that, um, because I've always seen it as this golden white light, but when I was writing Understanding Your Choice, I was overshadowed by this intense golden, pure golden light. And when I was writing the unveiling the secrets of the feminine principle, this beautiful white shimmering light just <laughs> appeared to me and I said, oh, that's the golden white light yeah what they, it's like they separated themselves out from my you know my mind to grasp that and I said that's where the golden white light comes and I got to see them separately but they're one and so that was just such a fantastic experience for me to see wow you know well, just, just sharing it it looks like golden white lights are coming out of you now yeah <laughs> Who, who can't see the actual uh, video here. <laughs> I, yes. I, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about in your chapter, in chapter seven of this book, you uh, write about sex. And yes. I have these interesting things and I'm, I don't know if this, maybe you have some insight into this, but my, myself personally, I came into this, my father used to say, you choose your parents. You, he, he, mm -hmm. would say, he chose you. We didn't choose you. You chose us. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I happen to come in with a tremendous amount of sexual energy. And I've mm-hmm. been trying to understand this part of myself better because it, it has evolved into such an out-of-body experience. And it's mm-hmm. accompanied by my speaking unusual sounds. I don't speak them. They just, I just, my, they just come out of my they mouth. come out of you. Yes. Yeah, they're not English, so I can't tell you what they, what language or thing that it might yeah. be. But I keep wondering, where is this all coming from, this later time in my body's life? You know, I'm an old lady here. <laughs> this, you know, I have tremendous sexual energy as a teenager and a young person and all the thrills of, you know, and it was a pretty love time in the 60s and 70s. And, yes. But that's not what I'm experiencing now. No. What I'm experiencing now is more like, it feels almost like a spiritual experience. Absolutely. Not like uh, just having an orgasm. It, so it is because it's a sexual dance. About this. Yes, you know, because me, it is. About the sexual, <laughs> and the questions I have for you, though, let me give you the questions since I have to give you my little shtick about my own self. You talk about the reader's mind opening up to the mystery of Shekinah and the mystery of sex, which are one and the same. Tell us about the interplay of the divine masculine and the divine feminine and this sexual dance. Yeah. Another, another and you know question. when you when you yeah when you say that I can remember so vividly when so, so what happens there is this there is this so the whole process of spiritual evolution and coming into consciousness is an actual physiological process. Mm-hmm. You know and and it was in, it's interesting when I was saying to you that it's not in my head. It's after as I grow older and I got to know and understand. It's really a body experience. It's a cellular experience. The evolution of consciousness takes place on a physiological process in the cells. And so this and it, it was another show for me to tell you. But because I know this, that ultimately, ultimately in the final stages of of enlightenment, the heart and the brain, there is like an intercourse. It's like a sexual dance between the head and the heart. And a light is established. They become one and you become this entity in this light that becomes permanent. You become permanently, because this you're created, a new being is created by this sexual exchange of the energies in your head and your heart. And you are, the cells of your body are transformed and you become a new person. Because that's what enlightenment actually is. And it's that sexual dance between those energies of masculine and feminine, the head and the heart, that comes together in a beautiful ex- interchange that just transform you. And so that is what I know to be the, the, the dance between the masculine and the feminine. It's you, it's in you, it's in your cells, it's in your body, it's your old transformation. And it, um, ah. <laughs> That kind of explains a little bit about even when growing up, I've never felt like I'm, my sexual relationships are all heterosexual relationships, mm-hmm. but I've never felt like I was a woman or a man. Yeah. It just felt like I was a being. Yes. So I've never related true. to like makeup and dressing up and I've never yes. <laughs> wanted to dress like a man. I mean, I just, it's none of those. I never could identify yes. with any of that. And I could never say mm-hmm. with, you're supposed to say you're a woman or you're a girl or you're yes it's not like I'm a being yeah, I'm a being because that's who we are really and I also find it interesting Gail that the first key in the tarot the fool is described as neither a lad nor a lass but both mm-hmm. and the last key in the major arcana the world is the dancer is also defined as both a man and a woman. So it's again that coming together of those two because they're never they have never been separate and cannot be separate. Well, um, and so that's why you feel like that because yes. it's true. 
I heard you. I was listening to you on another podcast on Rhonda's podcast, and you mentioned the um, tarot card, the Hierophant. Yes. And you said, and you said it represented the the Taurus, and I, I I'm a Taurus, mm-hmm. and when you said it was oh. a card about hearing, about being yes. able to hear, and mm-hmm. I thought to myself, oh, because all of my psychic or intuitive or whatever word you want to call has always been auditory, internal, auditory. Uh-huh. but I've never had, I've, you know, I've had a few visual things, but not much. My thing is yes. all auditory. The, the, yeah. And when you described the card, I said, oh, that that's really described what I experienced. So, I, yeah, there you are. You're yeah. giving me like good answers here that I've been looking for for my own self. So yes. I have another, another sexual question here. Uh, why do you say all life is continually in sexual embrace and the same sexual energy is responsible for all that is born and all that dies physically and spiritually spiritually what does all that mean yeah well because everything is energy Mm -hmm. and everything is constantly and forever in a sexual exchange and I and, and not sex in the term that you know most people, but there is an interplay all the time. Everything is connected. Everything is in a constant interplay with everything else because we're part of one big web of life. And so, in order for any other thing to be born those two things have to interchange energy so that they can create a third and so on and so forth and it's a continuous process of exchange of energies of the masculine and the feminine the polar the two poles and we are always creating and it's in a continuous sexual dance of life you don't understand how much I'm appreciating so much what you are saying this minute, because there's been a question in my mind about, uh, and you know, I've been with my husband, David, for 30 years. So that's the only man I've been with sexually Yes. at time. But before that, and in a previous marriage, I had many sexual partners. Mm-hmm. And I always kept asking myself, I don't understand why I have to have so many sexual partners and what's my issue here. Yes, I would meet people knowing that I'm perfectly sexually satisfied and happy in the relationship I'm in. I would find myself meeting other men and feeling this sexual thing happening. Mm -hmm. And I misinterpret it to that they wanted to have sex with me. And then when Mm -hmm. I would ask them, they'd say, oh, no, no, I I never wanted to have sex with you. Oh, no, (laughs) I never felt that way. And I kept asking myself, how long could I be that I felt these feelings and yet yes. the person is telling me, oh, no, no, no. And often I have, when it's the one of those persons, I've been trying to understand, there are people who I somehow get psychically entangled with. Yes. I know the things that are happening in their life. I know mm-hmm. whether they're going to be sick or I just, they, they're, inf- and I'm not asking for it. The information just yes, comes. Yes, coming. Yeah. But explaining that I could be in a sexual dance with them that's not of the, you know, yes. the rest physical, physical nature physical yeah yes then would clear up these feelings because when they'd say to me no no i'd be saying there's something wrong here because that's yeah. not what it felt like yeah no it's sex on another level yes and <laughs> yes. that yeah and it's a constant you're giving me yes. a great epiphanies right this minute <laughs> <laughs> no it's true yeah I and, and i think the term because the term sex has these connotations it's hard to understand then, you know, or probably problematic to understand that everything is in a sexual exchange, all of life, and all of life. And, and I've always felt very, like I was given a lot of that energy for some mm-hmm. reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But you could also call it, instead of me thinking of it as so sexual being a body, if I think of it more like life force energy. Life, yeah. You're alive in yes. your body. Yes. And, yes. And life livingness. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. now I understand that these men that I had these experiences with didn't they didn't realize that we were engaging sexually. 
because yeah. we were on some other different level that had to do with, with the actual physical body. Yeah. Kind. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then many times you meet people too who you've had relationships with in previous incarnations. That's another and, one that I wonder. Yes, and you feel the familiarity. Yes. When you meet them, you know, that I know you, you know, we've been together before in whatever way, but you can feel it. There's yeah. a body. When you have a heightened sense and your body's alive, yes. you know, then you can take in all that information. And um, it happens for me when I've had those happen and, and I married some of those people <laughs> <laughs> is that there's like a, I, I call it a whop, but oh. when they, first interaction physically where you see that person before mm -hmm. you even talk something happens in my body that feels like Whoosh. yes oh, you know and yeah. if we're awake enough to notice it mm -hmm. then yes there's been some kind it's not just an attraction or a spark yes it's, you know there's something more there yes yeah. boy yeah. this is great i'm having a great time on this show <laughs> <laughs> I just had two more questions because we are getting down to our, you know, last 10 or 15 yes. minutes. And um, there was something that you write about in the book that I was wondering you could explain about what do you mean by, I didn't know what liquid fire was, but you write about liquid fire and water and blood and water. And I didn't, I couldn't understand what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, the, you know, we, well, no, you know. Sex to the fire. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, we have fire and water, you know, in our bodies, we have protons, we have neutrons, we have electrons. And it's there's, there's this fire in our bodies that is responsible for a lot of the functioning, the systems being able to do what they, um, that they have to do. The, the kidneys, the heart, the intestines, you know, there's fire, because the elements of air, earth, fire, and water, the four, the five, you know, four basic elements are in our body. So we're a system that is in constant, you know, operation and movement and changes to refine us and to, you know, it's like even the food that we eat, breaking down the material and releasing um, potable gold into our bodies, you know, that they call it. And so this is a process. If we see ourselves as a living system where all of these chemical, biochemical, physiological processes are taking place, we're a living entity mm -hmm. with all of these energies in the system that we call our bodies. And with, when you don't think about it on that level, because you're just going about your body's doing what it does and you're just going about your life, you don't realize all of the biochemical functions that are taking place in your body, releasing heat, you know, and um, equalizing and your temperatures in your body and all of the systems working in harmony to sustain you. But um, this is, this is, this is, we're a living system. Mm -hmm. And so all that fire, that water and the blood carries all of those in the nutrients that feeds all of our organs to keep us and sustain us. And so um, when you look at the body from a physiological perspective as a system, then you will understand all of those elements that and all of those um, processes that take place in that system. And so it's, um, you know, it's maybe very physiological and yeah. chemical, but this is how, um, and it's, and, and this system is similar to the universe, you know, and all the other systems and stars and um, so much go on. If we recognize how fantastic and thorough this entity called the human entity is and all that goes on in it, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, 
and our bodies are the containers of all of those functions and then keep us sustained and evolved so that you know we can you know experience this this life that we came here to have <laughs> that's a beautiful answer to this uh i have a last little question, and the one other thing I would love to do is, after we answer this one other question, is if you could talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, about the work that you're doing now, uh, yes. with the environment, etc. I just was wondering about, you refer to mother a lot, and I don't know if that, now that I know we're not really necessarily meaning Mother Mary, but no. maybe, yeah. Um, you write about that the mother reveals to us about the nature of man and that she's she's she 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 explains that she has three aspects the mental aspect the mysteries of the heart and the the physical aspect mm -hmm. so I just wanted to finish on that and then I would just love to hear a little bit about what you're doing with the other project yeah that you have. Yeah, okay. So what do you want to know about the mother, the divine feminine? Because I well, it's about it's you you wrote about that she so she's create the, the divine feminine is made up of three parts. Yes. As is as is all as is all of us in physical manifestation. We have a physical body, an emotional body, and a mental body. And so those make up the the vehicle, you know, the physical vehicle that needs to be perfected. And that's what we're really here to do is to, because of how we eat and how we exercise and all of that, we strengthen and mature the physical body. And from an emotional perspective, we develop the emotional body. We're able to we're able to understand our emotions mm -hmm. and um, and understand them and work through them and see and understand how important they are to who you are. And we are educated in colleges, universities, schools to develop the mental body so that we're capable, like I said, you know, that was part of what um, the Piscean Age was about making sure that that physical, emotional, those, the, the physical, emotional, and mental bodies are developed and matured so that they are capable of housing the spirit. Because unless the house is built correctly, then the, the dweller in the house, the spirit cannot come and live in you. Because when at light, enlightenment, actually what happened is that this, because you have prepared this vehicle, which is the physical body, which consists of those three components, the physical, emotional, and mental bodies, the spirit can now dwell inside of you permanently. And that's what being God-man is really is. I now am both God and man because God has now come to dwell inside of my body because I have built a temple um, that is capable of accommodating that level of vibration and frequency that I am now walking on the planet. And that was always the goal, not for us to leave and go someplace to heaven, but that we are God and man in flesh. Because that was what the experiment was all about. How can I, how can I, build a vehicle so that spirit can dwell in me on this planet and I can live here as an enlightened being. And I don't have to die to accomplish that. And that's what um, the Piscean Age is was all about. And so this is, and the Divine Mother created these bodies to you know allow for humanity to be able to have this experience in flesh yeah i always from my personal experience um uh like i had cancer in my 30s when i was young 
Mm -hmm. And the way to heal it that I learned then and I still believe is the reasoning is that you can't just go to a doctor and have surgery. You have mm -hmm. to yeah. heal three parts. You got to heal the spirit, the soul. Absolutely. Uh, the emotional. You have to heal mm -hmm. all of that together. And exactly. I think that the physical ailments I've had, if I start to research and think about why do I have them, I'll find some sort of other uh, information coming to me that says, oh, well, you need to do this. That's why you're having this physical sickness. Mm -hmm. So There's I'm an like, emotional component yes. to the physical illness. And yeah. so, yeah, in order to heal completely, you have to heal all of it. All of it, because that's all yes. this whole universe in this body. Yes. So, uh, now that we're winding down, uh, we've about, well, you know, we're about a, we're a little bit over an hour now, so we have plenty of time, but <laughs> you're doing another thing besides writing all these amazing books, which I highly recommend our uh, listeners can go to Amazon, but it'll also be on the description. Uh, I also want to just also mention again here that you have a website, which we spoke about earlier, and I was wondering if you yourself could just say the website to the listeners. Okay, so the website is www.edadjackson.com. Perfect. So <laughs> uh, there was all this other work that you're doing now, and I, I don't know, I guess the the initials are C. ICGC, yes, the Institute for Conscious Global yes. Change. And it's so a very... Interestingly, it was when I was writing the second book, mm -hmm. Unveiling the Secrets of the Feminine Principle, this, I told you, this beautiful white energy light that you know, she says to me, go to the computer and sit down and concretize the ideas that you've been walking around with in your head for all these years. Oh. And I had to think about that for a second. And I recognized that I had always thought about how development could be done differently. And it would be uh, uh, by citizens and government sitting to get down together and identifying the issues in any given community and visually, you know, um, expressing or looking at them and um, in order to solve them because it had to be, you know, both working together and that. And but one of the things she emphasized, and I had thought about it vaguely, but when she said to go down, go to the computer and concretize it, I recognized that, and what she emphasized that there needed to be a visual platform on which you could see all these issues. So I had no idea. I had no idea about anything other than graphic design. That's the only visual I knew. <laughs> So I wrote up, I went to the computer like I was directed and I wrote up this idea about development and I put in graphic design because I, that's all I knew. And then I got invited to this information evening. I thought they were going to talk about the United Nations Millennium Development Goals and I got there and they weren't talking about that. They were at Columbia. I live close to Columbia and I didn't been invited to an evening and I thought it was going to be about, about the UN work. So I got there and it wasn't about that, but I met a young lady. She was from New Hampshire and she was as, just as disappointed as I was that it wasn't about the Millennium Development Goals. And I was telling her about this virtual global project that I had and I subtitled it a seed idea for a global Marshall Plan you know, the Marshall Plan after the Second World War and the United States helped to rebuild Europe. And I thought, what if we could have a global Marshall Plan? So all of these underdeveloped developing countries could be developed in a similar way in which Europe was developed through the Marshall Plan. So she said to me, you know what you need for that? And I said, no. She said, you need GIS. And I said, what is GIS? And she said, geographic information systems. Of course, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> so I went home and I Googled it and I thought, oh, and I said, this is it. This is what she's talking about. There's a map. 
GIS is a map of the world where everything is. So I went to my little proposal and I changed out graphic design for, for geographic information systems technology. And then I was, I, an entity appeared to me from another dimension and said to me that you are to go to the United Nations and present this work to the UN and become accredited. And he gave me specific instructions. He is Nordic. He comes in through this Nordic vibration. It was very clear to me and told me specifically what to do at the United Nations. And I am carrying them out. And his job is to transform the United Nations. So yeah, so that's the work that I, so I had, because when I wrote it up, I had expected to go over to the UN and say, here is a great idea. You know, I think you all should do this, right. but they had other plans for me. So I had to form the organization and I had to go to the United Nations and all of what has transpired. And, and the whole idea is that I feel with what she told me and how she told me, I don't know if you're aware of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's a new agenda that was developed like seven and a half years ago by the United Nations, in which all 193 countries agreed, participated and agreed on this agenda. And for the first time in the history of the United Nations, all 193 countries participated, together with civil society, businesses, academia, philanthropic organizations. So it's, it's touted as the most inclusive and comprehensive document that the United Nations has ever produced. Um, and this is the agenda that is supposed to, um, the, the overarching goal of the agenda is the eradication of extreme poverty. And what the Divine Mother told me to do is that with this technology of geographic information systems, earth observation, and geodesign and other um, technologies within that suite of technologies is that in the next three years, every country can be virtually developed in the cloud mm -hmm. and then be implemented. And she told me this is possible and you can do it. And she said all, and she said to me, all the resources that are needed to transform the world are already here. She basically was saying to me, I, the divine feminine has pro already provided all of the resources needed to do what it is that you are um, asked to do. So, and, I, and, I, and I know that's true. There are no lack of resources on the planet. And, and so was that in Kenya that you actually did a first community or has- So in Kenya, I did. So um, back in 2015, I did a proof of concept, which got adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. This was one of the other things he told me that I should get done. And it was interesting how it all happened. And then in 2019, I did a pilot to show the, the proof of concept. Um, for the proof of concept, we use secondary data from the World Bank, the UN, and you know other data. But for to do a pilot, you need to get on the ground so that you can collect primary data and interact with the people and actually you know um, gather the data in that way. Um, so that's what I did in 2019, just before the COVID. <laughs> I got out of there just in time for the COVID. Huh? Kenya. Kenya. Yes. Yes. So I, yeah, so I did that as, um, and that actually became my dissertation research. Um, yeah, because Antioch has a wonderful PhD program, which is a scholar practitioner program, PhD program that allows you to bring scholarship to your practice. So it became the perfect opportunity. The universe literally sent me there, says, okay, you need to get this done, you know. Well, it seems to me that you've continued to follow the auditory voices you're hearing. And yeah, or I'm being impressed with, because they're not. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes I do. It's just rolled into the next. It's not yes. like there's been a stop sign. 
It's yes. just no. guiding you along. And if you don't question and just go with the thing, the next door opens up for you. And, and, and Gail, that is exactly how it is. I mean, I'm going to tell you very briefly. I was at the UN, you know, to what you're saying. I was at the UN and this young gentleman just walked up to me. And he says, I see you here all the time. He says, I don't know what you do, but whatever you do, I think you do it very well because you're so focused. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much. And he said, by the way, what do you do? So I told him. And he said to me, he says, that is one of, if not the best project in the United Nations. And it needs to get adopted by the General Assembly. And I know how to do it. And I will help you free of cost. Just yeah. like that. And I said to him, how did you know that this is what I came here to do? Because that's exactly what the entity told me. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost to a word. So I thought, he says, I don't know, but I am to help you. So, you know, to your point, and it just happens like that. Yeah. And this is, yeah. So I've always said I am both a participant and an observer of the dance. It's just fantastic to watch. <laughs> I and when those magical things happen, I never take it for granted. When no, they, I'm always, always in like, awe. You know, how awe many of them surprise. happen? Yes. I'm always in awe. Yeah. I don't expect it. I don't think yes. that this is my way and everything's going to just come. It's no. just when it does, I just say I'm very grateful and thank yes. Constantly in, you know, in gratitude for all of what, the universe just keeps unfolding to me. Yeah. That's very beautiful. So I'm going to wind the show down now. And I always ask my guests if there's any little last words of wisdom or anything they would like to share with the listeners before we sign off. <laughs> well, I know that it might be the same, very self-serving, but I really believe people should read that book on uh, understanding your choice especially now because after all these years I wrote the understanding your choice 22 years ago mm -hmm. it's also the age of my grandson I say in my book that the both of them came into the world at the same time but I, for the first time after since writing it, that book I've started going back and reading it mm -hmm. and wow isn't it timely it's so timely if you it's like Oh, I, I wrote this. <laughs> yeah. I came because I'm seeing it all play out right now. Yeah. It's like it yeah. was written through you. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's so current. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the beauties about the ancient mis mysteries is that they're timeless. You That's know, right. yeah. So I would really recommend that. And not be just because I'm the author, but I think if you really are in confusion, or not understanding what's happening, understanding your choice is the book. And, they, and they, that's what they told me. They said, this is the time when humanity needs this information to contextualize what's going on. And so that's what I would wanna leave people with. Well, I'm going to, as when we hang up, I'm ordering my copy because you have <laughs> four books and I didn't know, I always I always order the book of my, list, of my guest but I didn't know which one to do here. So now that we've spoken, that's the one that I'm going to order right away. Yeah. Uh, I subscribe to your channel. Thank you. So I know I'll find more about you. Yeah. And maybe we can have another podcast sometime later in 2000. Of course, I'd be happy to. That's wonderful. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank don't, you. Don't go away. I'm just going to tell our audiences that we appreciate you liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, and meeting all the new guests that we have because we're trying to be diversified and having guests from all different countries talking about all different types of topics. I wanna thank Edda for being with us here today. And um, I, I look forward to uh, any of your upcoming comments on any of the shows. I want to thank my son, Richard, for producing and my daughter, Nancy, for posting all of this for me. And I wish all of you a wonderful, wonderful week ahead. And I also want to remind you all to share your stories with each other, because remember, stories can heal. Thanks and have a great week.
Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gail. Yeah.